Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. Tonight's talk is going to be a new historical journey, spanning centuries and continents, exploring the history of cosmetics and perfume from prehistory to present day. I'll tell you about techniques, ingredients, discoveries, beauty standards, and practices. Moreover, I will delve into what they tell us about the societies where they existed. Cosmetics and perfumes, although distinct topics, intertwine seamlessly in their development. They reflect the same aspiration of people to artificially modify their outward presentation to the world. Begin by adopting a comfortable position and consciously release the tension in your body. From your shoulders and arms to your legs, fingers and toes. If you happen to fall asleep, don't worry, as there are timestamps available in the description of the video, and they are also pinned in the first comment. Additionally, the comment provides links to audio streaming, such as Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, and other sites if you prefer to listen to the stories there. You can also find a link to our Facebook page where you can get updates. If you are so kind, please subscribe to my channel and click the like button. This helps support the channel and limits ads as much as possible. Let's start our journey now. While we may be familiar with perfume fragrances, let's explore the definition of cosmetics. Cosmetics serve various purposes they can be utilized for body protection and cleansing, similar to hygiene products. Alternatively, cosmetics can be employed to enhance one's appearance through makeup. What unifies all cosmetics is that they are a mixture of compounds, whether natural or synthetic, specifically formulated for these purposes. The practice of altering one's appearance with pigmented paint, which can be considered a form of cosmetic body art, dates back to ancient times, potentially even during prehistoric periods. The exact origins of this practice are uncertain, but it holds significant historical relevance. It is believed that cosmetic body art could have been one of the earliest forms of ritual in human culture, showcasing that humans have long been concerned with their appearance and sought ways to modify it. The desire to modify one's appearance extends beyond the realm of breeding as seen in various animal species that engage in appearance modification and exhibit specific behaviors to attract sexual partners. However, early humans had additional motivations. The practice of modifying one's appearance through cosmetic body art was tied to cultural and symbolic purposes. It served as a means of expressing cultural identity, communicating societal roles, or conveying symbolic messages. Prehistoric humans may have painted on cave walls for similar reasons, and they adorned their bodies with paint. This is evident from the discovery of mineral pigments such as red, at various archaeological sites, including the existence of ancient crayons crafted tens of thousands of years ago by Homo sapiens in Africa. 
However, there is limited evidence regarding how or why and what body art meant to prehistoric humans. Nevertheless, body art stands as one of the earliest forms of artistic expression, deeply rooted in culture. As we dwell further, we will discover that the perception of makeup in different past societies was also highly influenced by culture. Aesthetical criteria were constantly present, and the use of makeup served as a reflection of one's social position. In ancient society, and even in more recent times, social status, gender, and occupation, the lineated strict boundaries that have become somewhat blurred in the modern era, although not completely erased. In the early 20th century in Western countries, there were societal expectations that had to be adhered to in order to be accepted and respected within one social circle. These expectations extended to the use of cosmetics, particularly makeup. The lines that existed with regards to the use of cosmetics and makeup were not easily crossed if one desired social acceptance and respect. We will embark on an exploration from ancient Egypt, China, the Middle East, Greece, and Rome, to Europe and America, examining how this cultural practice evolved into an industry over the past two centuries. Among the earliest recorded instances of cosmetic use, ancient Egypt stands out thanks to their carvings, painting, sculptures, and even writings. In Egypt, both men and women utilize makeup to enhance their appearance, albeit primarily those of certain wealth and social standing. The majority of the population occupied with outdoor work and survival didn't have time and resources to invest in their appearance, although they were not oblivious to its existence. Elaborate makeup and perfumes were predominantly associated with a select elite, often depicted abundantly in Egyptian art, while the general population tended to adhere to simpler dress styles. Ancient Egyptians made use of basic and affordable ingredients to produce cosmetics including creams for scar healing. Medical professionals were accessible to provide such treatments. Kohl, spelled K-O-H-L, an eyeliner and eyeshadow, emerged as one of the most popular cosmetic products in ancient Egypt. Its origins can be traced back to North Africa and it continues to be widely used in Africa and India to this day. Coal was traditionally created by grinding a mineral known as stibnite, or antimony. However, charcoal served as a more accessible alternative for many. The belief was that coal offered protection against the sun's harmful rays, although the degree of this protection remains uncertain. In addition to its believed protective qualities, ancient Egyptians enhanced the properties of coal by incorporating other substances to make it more effective against infections and more appealing in terms of appearance and fragrance. For instance, during the New Kingdom in the second millennium BC, the refinement of coal involved adding highly valued and expensive ingredients 
like frankincense or spices such as cinnamon. These materials were sourced from Asia and throughout Africa, reaching Egypt via the ancient spice road. Apart from the distinctive lines of coal around their eyes, the Egyptians utilized a range of eyeshadow colors derived from ground minerals. Some colors were easily attainable and inexpensive, like red ochre, while others were considerably pricier. An example of a costly pigment was green, obtained from malachite. Blue eye shadow was achieved using another stone called azurite, bromine which naturally appears red in normal temperature, was also used as a dye in makeup. However, the ancient Egyptians were unaware of its long-term toxicity. Overextended periods of exposure to bromide could harm the central nervous system. The ancient Egyptians employed various ingenious techniques when creating cosmetics and skincare products. For instance, they utilized the iridescent substance found in fish scales to produce shimmering lipstick. They also developed skincare remedies such as treatments for wrinkles using gum or frankincense, and ointments made from red ochre, coal, honey, wormwood, to reduce scars and burns. Based on the discovery found in jars, it appears that they even concocted a setting lotion using beeswax and resin. Moreover, the ancient Egyptians chewed herbs and wore frankincense to enhance their breath. It is worth noting that while these cosmetics and drugs were used for centuries, some of them were toxic and ultimately caused more harm than good. So, as you see, the ancient Egyptians had a wide range of grooming and cosmetic products, showing their dedication to enhancing their appearance. This emphasis on self-care extended even to the afterlife, as many of these makeup products and recipes were buried with them in their tombs. They even used some of these products on mummies. Examples of such practices can be seen during the Egyptian New Kingdom, as well as in ancient China during the Shang Dynasty, both dating back to the second millennium BC. In China, the first documented cosmetic product was a powder called rouge. Interestingly, across different cultures and regions, we observe a recurring practice particularly among women, of using cosmetics to add a reddish hue to their lips and cheeks. This practice was found in ancient Egypt, China, Greece, Rome, and even mentioned in the Old Testament. It continued throughout the Middle Ages and persists to this day. So why red and not another color? The preference of the color red in cosmetics, specifically on the cheeks, can be attributed to several reasons. Firstly, red has particular advantages as it is relatively easy to obtain through natural red dyes like red ochre, which were readily available in many ancient cultures. Additionally, even as other colors became accessible, the use of red persisted. One possible explanation is that red complements various skin tones, 
making it a more universal choice. In the context of China, red has been associated with success and good fortune for a long time, adding cultural significance to its use. However, associated with success and good fortune for a long time, adding cultural significance to its use. However, the widespread adoption of red in cosmetics and its enduring presence may also invite sociological and psychological interpretations. The application of a red tint on the cheeks, simulating a blush, can elicit a range of responses and convey subtle social cues. That is to say, the artificial reproduction of the blush-like phenomenon on the cheeks through the use of red in cosmetics may convey something meaningful. Blushing is a natural bodily reaction associated with feelings of excitement or shame, maybe embarrassment or guilt. So maybe by recreating this phenomenon with cosmetics, it suggests a connection to these emotions. Emotions being involuntary reactions are considered reliable indicators of inner states. Unlike verbal communication, bodily reactions are more difficult to deceive or falsify, making them a potentially authentic expression of one's emotions. So, the act of reddening the face, either naturally or through the application of rouge in makeup, can convey an implicit message signals a person's commitment to social relationships and their willingness to express emotions openly. This visible expression of feelings suggests a certain level of authenticity and reliability in human interactions. When someone feels shame or embarrassment, it can be seen as a genuine reflection of their emotional state. Of course, it's important to note that individuals who apply rouge, particularly women, may not consciously think about these underlying reasons. Aesthetic practices can often detach themselves from their original purposes although they still contribute to the widespread appeal of using rouge in makeup. The association of red makeup, particularly rouge, with sexual availability in many cultures can appear paradoxical at first. However, upon closer examination, this connection may not be entirely surprising when considering the broader cultural connotations and societal perceptions surrounding the color red. Red has long been associated with passion, desire, and sensuality. In the context of makeup, the use of red may serve as a nonverbal signal or a visual marker of sexual allure and readiness. This association does not necessarily imply prostitution, but rather suggests an implicit understanding of the connection between redness and sexuality. The application of red makeup is often linked both in our collective consciousness and cultural norms to notions of seduction and even provocation this meaning, whether justified or not, has become ingrained in our social codes. The use of red makeup, when intentionally emphasized, is recognized as a deliberate statement that aligns these associations of seduction and provocation. It is important to note that interpretations of such symbols can vary 
across different cultures and contexts. In ancient China, the color that appeared early in makeup during the first millennium BC was white. White rice powder was used to whiten the face, serving as a precursor to foundation. This cosmetic practice aimed to create unified skin tone and conceal imperfections. However, the choice of white as a cosmetic color was not random. In various Asian cultures, white traditionally carried meanings associated with death, war, and even grief, deferring from the symbolic associations in Western traditions. White in these cultures is often seen as a symbol of purity, carrying stronger social significance. In ancient societies, having fair skin compared to the rest of the population signaled someone could stay indoors and avoid manual work. The use of white makeup represented a desire for a paler complexion, reflecting ideas of beauty and societal standards prevalent at that time. In various societies, including China, Japan, India, ancient Egypt, and the Greco-Roman world, having fair and clear skin was associated with belonging to higher social classes. It was particularly emphasized for aristocratic women who were expected to have younger-looking skin free from the effects of the sun. Tanning, on the other hand, was seen as a sign of lower social status. By whitening their skin with powder, women of higher classes made a visible statement of their social standing. This cultural taboo surrounding the skin tone of women from privileged backgrounds, persisted across different regions and time periods. However, this societal norm began to diminish in the 20th century, particularly in industrialized countries, with the increasing availability of factory jobs, the once desirable pale complexion associated with wealthy, inactive women became attainable for the working class. An interesting shift occurred in the second half of the 20th century, where tanning started to gain desirability in mainstream culture. Tanned skin came to symbolize a lifestyle of leisure and leisurely sun exposure, signifying a reversal in societal perceptions. Sun exposure, which was once seen negatively, became viewed as something positive. This transformation reflects changing beauty standards and cultural shifts in attitudes towards leisure and the outdoors. In the present day, the extremely pale faces that were considered desirable for women in the 18th and 19th centuries are now associated with disease and are no longer widely desirable, at least in the Western cultures. However, in Asia and many other countries, traditional beauty standards, the influence of Western aesthetics, and the understanding that sun exposure accelerates skin aging contribute to the persistent of valuing fair skin. The majority of women in these regions still avoid excessive sun exposure and tanning, as darker skin resulting from sun exposure is generally considered less desirable. This contrast in beauty standards 
highlights the social and cultural nature of perceptions of skin color. In sub-Saharan Africa, where people naturally have darker skin, that does not significantly change color due to sun exposure. The societal expectations and ideals surrounding skin tone differ from those in other regions. These variations demonstrate the influence of social factors and cultural norms in shaping beauty ideals and preferences regarding skin color. Making their skin look paler to communicate their social position would have made no sense, and it illustrates how cultural use of makeup can be. Men in various cultures were also expected to engage in grooming and personal care practices, shaving regularly and using ointments or methods to conceal visible imperfections were common practice for men. This indicates that appearance did indeed matter to them, and it continues to hold significance. However, the use of makeup specifically became predominantly associated with women. This association was not fixed throughout history. In the context of makeup becoming mostly feminine, it is important to acknowledge that societal norms and beauty standards evolve over time. There were periods such as in the 17th and 18th century Europe where the use of makeup by men experienced a notable shift. During this time, men in European society did engage in the use of cosmetics challenging the notion that its usage was exclusively limited to women. The perception and acceptance of makeup as gendered practice can vary across different historical and cultural contexts. During certain historical periods, men also engaged in using makeup such as applying copious amounts of powder and lipstick. However, there were social norms that dictated the appropriate use of cosmetics for both men and women. Crossing the boundaries of these norms, either by using too much or too little makeup, could invite disapproval from society. These norms were likely influenced by the social order, but also represented aesthetic ideals that determined what was considered beautiful or not in a particular society. Ancient Greece and Rome serve as notable examples of societies with distinct beauty standards. When compared to early periods in the ancient Egypt or ancient China, where applying heavy makeup, as we just discussed, and almost all natural-looking faces were prevalent, as no one in China had skin white as milk, or in Egypt, with the use of heavy, dark lines around their eyes, or blue or green eyelids, the Greek and Roman cultures embraced a different conception of beauty. They appreciated the natural beauty found in nature and believed in preserving or enhancing it to a certain extent. For them, unnatural and excessively forced embellishments went against their ideals of beauty. Indeed, throughout history, beauty standards and practices related to makeup have been influenced by a complex interplay of social norms, aesthetic preferences, and cultural values. Each culture has developed its own unique perspective on what is considered beautiful and the proper methods of enhancing 
or adorning one's appearance. These standards can vary significantly from one society to another, reflecting the values, beliefs, and ideals of that particular culture. The use of makeup and beauty practices are deeply rooted in the cultural context in which they emerge. From ancient civilization to modern times, different societies have embraced diverse notions of beauty, ranging from natural aesthetics to elaborate embellishments. The acceptable use of makeup has been guided by both explicit and implicit rules, with individuals navigating the boundaries set by their culture norms and expectations. By recognizing the multifaceted influences on beauty standards, we gain a deeper understanding of the diverse expressions of beauty across different cultures throughout history. It emphasizes the importance of cultural context in shaping perceptions of beauty and highlights that beauty ideals are not fixed, but rather evolve and adapt throughout time and across societies. Although the Romans, influenced by philosophical conceptions, moral ideals and principles tended to condemn the use of makeup, the actual practices within Roman society revealed a different reality. Despite the philosophical stance against cosmetic usage, historical evidence indicates that the use of cosmetics was widely spread in ancient Rome, particularly among women. The rhetoric of condemnation can be found in the works of various authors, illustrating the philosophical disapproval towards the adornment of the face. However, the existence of widespread cosmetic practices contradicting these condemnations sheds light on the societal dynamics and the interplay between ideals and everyday realities. These practices showcase the discrepancy between philosophical principles and the behavior of the society or a particular group within it. Analyzing the interplay between contrasting elements provides valuable insights into the culture, society, and various groups within ancient Rome. Despite the prevalent philosophical condemnation of using makeup, the fact is that it was widespread among women highlights the significant influence of cultural factors and individual choices in shaping beauty practices. It also signifies a resistance or even defiance of societal principles. This discrepancy between the philosophical ideals and the actual behavior of people in ancient Rome emphasizes the complexity of cultural dynamics. It suggests that beauty practices are not solely determined by philosophical or even moral principles, but they are deeply intertwined with cultural norms, personal preferences, and societal expectations. The prevalence of makeup usage among women in ancient Rome indicates the capacity of individuals to challenge or deviate from established norms and to shape their personal expressions of beauty. The examination of these contrasting elements allows for a more comprehensive comprehension of the intricacies within ancient Roman society. It unveils the complex interplay between cultural ideals and the practicalities of everyday life. Furthermore, it serves as a reminder 
that beauty standards and behaviors are not rigid or immutable, but rather subject to the diverse range of influences and choices made by individuals within their cultural context. The diverse influences that shape beauty standards encompass a multiple of factors, including philosophical beliefs, societal norms, historical context, and even individual agency. This acknowledgement prompts us to recognize the dynamic nature of beauty practices and their ever-changing landscape of society ideals. Consequently, our understanding of ancient Roman society becomes enriched as we comprehend the nuanced relationship between steadfast cultural norms and the individual expressions and adaptations of beauty standards. Compared to cultures like Egypt, there was generally more moderation in the use of makeup in ancient Rome. The prevailing beauty ideal in Rome was to appear natural. However, women from high society still invested significant effort and utilized various cosmetic products to achieve a seemingly effortless and beautiful natural look. The visible application of makeup could be perceived as deceitful or manipulative in Roman society. In the context of Rome, the excessive use of cosmetics was directly associated with prostitution, which was not a marginal phenomenon, but an established institution. Brothels existed in towns of a certain size, and their locations were well known to the public. Prostitution occupied a low position in the social hierarchy of Roman society, yet it was recognized and had an identifiable role. This context highlights the social stigma attached to the overuse of cosmetics in Rome and its association with the profession of prostitution. The perception of copious makeup application as deceptive or manipulative reflects the moral and social norms of the time. Understanding these social dynamics provides insight into the complexities of beauty ideals, societal judgments, and the associations formed between certain practices and specific social positions within ancient Roman society. In ancient Rome, men from all social classes frequented brothels, and most prostitutes had a meager income that was just enough for survival. As these prostitutes aged and became increasingly reliant on their income, they resorted to applying more makeup to maintain their appeal and continue working in the business. Consequently, for respectable women in higher society, the last image they desired to resemble was that of an aging prostitute. It was not only the amount of makeup used that carried negative connotations, but also the choice of exaggerated colors, further emphasizing the distinction between the desired appearance of good society women and the perceived appearance of old prostitutes. And something of that still exists in our cultural codes, Maybe it has started to change and will disappear eventually, but we still have this association between prostitution or sexual invite and ostentation's makeup in the back of our minds. So no ostentatious makeup for Roman women of the good society, but still a lot of cosmetics were designed to preserve youth and look natural. 
They had countless beauty masks using all sorts of plants and animal ingredients like sweat from sheep's wool, fruit juice, seeds, honey, vinegar, eggs, animal excrement, yes, ground oyster shell and various resins like frankincense or myrrh. In ancient Rome, in extreme cases for very wealthy women, there were practices such as bathing in milk, which served as a form of chemical peel. Notably, Cleopatra was renowned for doing this, as well as Popea Savina, the second wife of Emperor Nero. Following these milk baths, Roman women would apply face whitener in moderate amounts to avoid an overly obvious appearance. This whitening substance could be chalk powder or white lead. was another one, and it was poisonous. Besides face whitener, Roman women also utilized rouge and coal for their eyes. It is important to note that fashion and beauty preferences in Rome evolved over time, and no specific trend lasted for the entirety of Roman history. These variations in tastes and styles highlight the dynamic nature of beauty practices within ancient Rome. During a significant period, Roman beauty preferences included dark eyebrows that nearly met in the center. To achieve this look, individuals darkened their eyebrows and extended them inward. The use of perfume was also widespread during this time, a topic we will explore further when discussing perfumes. The trend for pale faces, which emerged in Rome, continued to dominate beauty standards in the European Middle Ages. By the late medieval period, some women went to extreme measures, even asking their physicians to bleed them in an attempt to attain paler skin. Voluntary bleeding was believed to have medical benefits despite being ineffective and potentially harmful. However, one advantage of this practice, if it can be called an advantage, was its temporary ability to make individuals appear paler for a few days. These historical accounts demonstrate the enduring significance placed on paleness in European beauty standards. From Roman times through the Middle Ages, societies expressed a strong preference for light or pale skin, highlighting the influence of cultural ideals and the lengths individuals would go to conform to these standards. During the late medieval period, Europe experienced fluctuations in attitude towards makeup. Sometimes makeup was viewed unfavorably and even disappeared from artistic representations, as seen during the time of the Reformation. However, there were also periods when the aristocratic class embraced makeup in a highly visible manner. One notable example is the English court of Queen Elizabeth I in the 16th century. However, perhaps no other time displayed as much interest in makeup as France in the 17th and 18th centuries. Historical portraits from this period depict a resurgence of heavy makeup in France, particularly by the mid-17th century. The court of Louis XIV, known as the Sun King, played a significant role in setting fashion standards for aristocratic circles throughout Europe. 
This included opulent clothing and the use of makeup for both men and women. But it was not customary for individuals to wear such elaborate makeup every day as it became more associated with ceremonial dress. The use of heavy makeup was also common in theatrical performances, a world the Sun King was drawn to. Louis XIV desired his court to be a spectacle, and thus a style of unnatural makeup emerged, featuring very pale faces, red lips, and red cheeks. This specific style became socially acceptable and represented the prevailing beauty standards of the time. His emphasis on elaborate makeup and distinctive appearances reflected the grandeur and theatricality of the era, especially in the court of Louis XIV. By the 18th century, fashion trends underwent changes, but the use of makeup persisted. The attitudes towards makeup varied across countries with some being stricter and more restrained than others. But in most of Europe, a significant backlash against makeup emerged in the 19th century. The prevailing aristocratic culture that characterized the period leading up to such events, such as American independence, the French Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars, underwent transformation the extravagant aspects of the 18th century aristocracy, including excessive spending on clothing, ostentatious makeup, and an indulgence in war, fell out of favor. These practices were increasingly seen as signs of moral decay, even vice. So the 19th century reflected a shift in cultural values and a reevaluation of the aristocratic lifestyle. The excessive use of makeup, once emblematic of extravagance, was now viewed unfavorably. The changing societal attitudes and the desire of moral rectitude contributed to the decline of makeup's popularity during this period. In the 19th century, there was a shift towards a more restrained use of cosmetics, although they did not disappear entirely. However, highly visible makeup became primarily associated with prostitutes and theatrical performances. This can be seen through the attitude of Queen Victoria, who publicly expressed that makeup was improper and vulgar. Despite this prevailing sentiment, two other phenomena were occurring during that time. The first was the increasing availability and use of mirrors. The diffusion of mirrors allowed for greater self-reflection and the ability to apply makeup more precisely. This accessibility may have contributed to the continued use of cosmetics, albeit in a more discreet fashion. The ability of mirrors in the 19th century provided individuals with the opportunity to manage their personal grooming and uphold their appearance in the privacy of their own spaces. Even the poor could afford them. Despite the disapproval of makeup openly displayed by Queen Victoria and societal norms, the use of mirrors enabled individuals to engage in self-care routines behind closed doors. Mirrors served as essential tools for individuals to refine their looks and maintain personal grooming habits away from the public eye, granting them a degree of privacy in the practice of grooming and cosmetics. 
Until the 1800s, mirrors were luxury items that only a few people had access due to their expensive nature. However, with the advent of new industrial processes, mirrors became more affordable and accessible. As a result, self-awareness and the act of daily self-reflection on one's appearance began to trickle down from the upper classes to the broader society. By the end of the 19th century, mirrors were present in more households, allowing individuals from various social strata to have a clear image of their own appearance. This newfound ability to see oneself reflected in a mirror was a relatively new phenomenon in human history. Additional photography played a role in expanding visual self-awareness to a lesser extent during this period. The advancement of photography technology made it possible for individuals to capture and preserve visual representations of themselves further contributing to the concept of self-perception and visual self-awareness. The growing self-awareness among individuals coupled with the Industrial Revolution brought about significant changes in the ability and accessibility of consumer goods. The expansion of the population that had means to spend on such goods played a crucial role in this transformation. Consequently, there was a rising demand for various products, including cosmetics and perfumes, which promised to enhance one's image, or at the very least, create the illusion of improvement. Traditionally, cosmetics had been produced at home by artisans who catered to a small number of wealthy clients. But with the changing landscape of consumer habits and the rise of a larger market, cosmetics transitioned into the hands of businesses and companies. This shift allowed for the wider production and distribution of cosmetics making them available to a broader range of clients. The industrialization of cosmetics brought about increased convenience, standardization, and access to a variety of products that could help individuals improve their appearance. During the 19th century, the first cosmetics and perfume businesses emerged with multiple outlets and a wide customer base. Some of these businesses continue to be renowned brand names to this day. For instance, Guerlain was founded in Paris in 1828, and Rimmel, originating in London, was established in 1834. Similar to other industries during that time, these businesses implemented new production methods to reduce costs and actively advertised their products to the public. Advertising played a significant role in the expansion of the cosmetics industry. In the 1850s, some of the earliest billboards and magazine ads promoting cosmetics were created for the American brand Pons. European cosmetic makers quickly adopted and copied this form of communication. The advent of advertisements helped popularize cosmetic brands, reach a wider audience, and fuel the public's desire for cosmetic products. This marked a significant shift in the marketing and promotion of cosmetics as the industry increasingly embraced contemporary advertising techniques to attract customers. At the beginning of the 20th century, 
The cosmetics industry had already established itself as a small but growing sector. Beauty products were becoming increasingly accessible to a wider consumer base, primarily through department stores and specialized retail stores. But makeup was not as prevalent during this period as the prevailing taste of high society favored pale skins without visible makeup. This preference influenced the rest of society to emulate this natural style. Despite the minimal use of makeup, various beauty creams, hair products, and skincare items were readily available. The attitude towards makeup underwent a change starting around 1910 and intensified in the 1920s. This shift was largely influenced by the film industry, including Hollywood movies and the development of magazines. Media representations played a significant role in shaping beauty standards and popularizing makeup. Technological innovations also contributed to the changing perception of makeup. These innovations improved the quality, affordability, and safety of cosmetic products. Additionally, the reputation of makeup suffered due to the potential toxicity of homemade products. As a result, consumers began to rely more on commercially manufactured cosmetics, which offered standardized and regulated formulas. Overall, the combination of media influence, technological advancements, and a growing market for beauty products led to a transformation in the attitude towards makeup during the early 20th century. By the early 20th century, public awareness had grown regarding the dangerous nature of various cosmetics used in previous centuries, such as the use of white lead. These historical cosmetic recipes relied on natural ingredients rather than synthetic ones, highlighting the potential dangers of utilizing nature, who is ready to kill you if you don't understand its effects. However, a notable invention emerged in the 1920s, known as the eyebrow pencil. This invention quickly gained popularity due to its affordability, fashion-forward appeal, and safety. The eyebrow pencil utilized a new ingredient called hydrogenated cottonseed oil, which was developed by the chemical industry. The 1920s and 1930s marked the emergence of many present-day mass-market makeup manufacturers. These companies capitalized on the growing demand for cosmetics and took advantage of advancements in production and distribution. The chemical innovations of this era played a significant role in expanding the range of safe and commercially produced makeup products available to consumers. The combination of scientific advancements and changing fashion trends during this period contributed to the rise of the modern cosmetics industry. In the history of cosmetics, Notable figures such as Elena Rubinstein, Elizabeth Arden, Maybelline in America, and L'Oreal in Europe made significant contributions. These individuals and companies introduced new products that created new beauty needs among consumers. This range of products extended from hair dyes to fake tan products, 
which is ironic considering the historical focus on making people appear paler. Presently, cosmetics can assist individuals in achieving an artificially tanned look. But beauty standards can be rigid and, at times, lamentably so. For a considerable duration, placing great importance on conforming to these standards was primarily limited to a small segment of society, the privileged few. The influence of these beauty moguls and their products played a role in shaping societal perceptions of beauty and establishing certain ideals to aspire to. Despite the expansion of the cosmetics industry and its availability to a broader range of consumers, beauty standards have persisted and have often been imposed by societal expectations. The increased mass awareness of appearance, along with improvements in living standards, resulted in greater accessibility to beauty products. But this accessibility also brought forth a new health hazard. One significant example, particularly prevalent in America from the 1920s on, was a phenomenon of black women bleaching their skin to achieve a lighter complexion. This practice stemmed from the desire to be better accepted and conform to imposed beauty standards. It is important to note the social pressures and discriminatory beauty ideals that influenced such decisions. Additionally, during the 1920s, the practice of hair straightening also became more widespread. This technique aimed to alter the natural texture of hair, often to align with prevailing standards of beauty. The increased popularity of hair straightening can be seen as another manifestation of the societal pressures and beauty norms of that time. These examples highlight how beauty standards and societal expectations can lead individuals to pursue potentially harmful practices in their quest to conform or to be accepted according to prevailing norms. It is crucial to recognize and challenge such harmful beauty ideals in order to promote inclusivity, and self-acceptance. The dangerous nature of skin bleaching illustrates the extent to which individuals are willing to endure risks and pain in order to conform or alter their appearance to what they perceive as desirable in order to be accepted. This tells you a lot about the social importance placed on physical appearance. In many social interactions, you are what you look like and you are what you smell like. This highlights how both visual and olfactory aspects contribute to the overall image and impression one portrays in social contexts. The emphasis on appearance and scent underscores the societal expectations and judgments that can influence individuals' self-perception and interaction with others. So now let's take a look at the history of perfume. Perfume and scent differ in that perfume is a deliberately created blend of scents. The word perfume originates from the Latin word perfumes, which means through smoke. Therefore, perfume has a purposeful and intricate formulation 
It is a product designed to capture one or more natural or synthetic aromas. Fragrance is often incorporated into many cosmetic products. Perfume as a distinct category of scents encompasses carefully crafted compositions that evoke specific olfactory experiences. These perfumes can be made using a combination of natural extracts and synthetic compounds. The intention behind the creation of perfumes is to provide a sensory experience that is pleasing and can contribute to personal grooming or even self-expression. Additionally, fragrance is commonly found in various cosmetic products beyond dedicated perfumes. Many cosmetic items such as lotions and creams, body care products, they all incorporate fragrance as an added sensory element. The inclusion of fragrance in these products enhances the overall sensory experience and contributes to the overall aesthetic and appeal of the cosmetic items. The practice of enhancing cosmetics with pleasant fragrances is not a recent phenomenon. It has been observed throughout history. The ancient Egyptians, for example, incorporated incense or spices into their cosmetics to impart a pleasant scent. But the process of creating perfumes is more complicated because it involves extracting a particular scent and preserving it in a different medium. How is it done? How did perfumes develop? This is what we're going to explore next. The oldest known perfume maker whose existence has been recorded dates back to ancient Mesopotamia. The perfume maker was a woman named Taputi. While her precise techniques and creations may not be fully known, her significance lies in being documented as an early figure in the world of perfumery. This information sheds light on the ancient origins of perfume making and the prominent role that women like Taputi played in the industry's early history. Around 1200 BC, more than 3,000 years ago, a tablet records the existence of a woman who holds the distinction of being the world's first recorded chemist. While specific details about her are scarce, it is mentioned that she served as the overseer of the royal palace, indicating her important role in ancient Mesopotamian government. This woman developed methods for extracting scents showcasing her expertise in scent extraction techniques. Despite limited information, the tablet provides valuable insights into the historical development of the perfume-making process and highlights this ancient chemist's pioneering role in ancient Mesopotamia. In her work, she utilized various materials such as flowers, oil, and different plants, subjecting them to multiple filtration processes. However, her most groundbreaking technique was the use of solvents. The use of solvents allowed for more efficient extraction of aromatic compounds which are the basis of scents. Different methods exist for extracting these compounds. The four methods that have been discovered and continue to be in use in perfume making are distillation, solvent extraction, expression, 
and entourage. What do these terms mean? The aromatic compounds, which are key components of essential oil, the concentrated oily liquids that can be obtained from plants. The term essential is used because these oils contain the essence or the true fragrance of the plant. The first method, distillation, is a method that involves passing steam through fresh plant materials, such as flowers, and collecting the condensed vapor, which contains the aromatic compounds. Solvent extraction, on the other hand, utilizes solvents to dissolve the aromatic components from the plants, creating a fragrant solution. Enflourage is another technique where flowers, such as jasmine or tuberose, are placed on a greasy substance, often animal fat, to absorb their aromatic compounds. The process is repeated with fresh flowers until the fat is saturated with the desired fragrance. These methods, developed over centuries, are still utilized today in the creation of perfumes. Each technique offers its unique approach to extracting and preserving the aromatic compounds, contributing to the diversity and complexity of scents found in the world of perfumery. The first method of extracting essential oils, distillation, involves passing steam through fresh plant material, as I mentioned, for an extended period of time, usually exceeding one hour. During this process, the aromatic volatile oils present in the plant are carried away by the steam. Once the steam and oils are cooled, they naturally separate, allowing the essential oil, which has a high concentration of aromatic compounds, to be collected. Dry distillation serves as an alternative to steam distillation. In this method, no water is added to the process. Instead, the plant materials are subjected to heat, resulting in a slightly toasted or burned scent in the obtained essential oil. This toasted fragrance is considered desirable when distilling certain types of foods, for example. Both steam distillation and dry distillation are valuable techniques for extracting essential oils and capturing the aromatic essence of various plants. These methods have been employed for centuries and continue to be utilized in the production of perfumes as well as in culinary and other applications where capturing the aromatic compounds is desired. Apart from distillation, another method used in extracting aromatic compounds is solvent extraction. This technique is employed when certain blends or plant materials are too delicate or sensitive to undergo the heat involved in distillation. In solvent extraction, the plant material is immersed in a solvent that separates the aromatic lipids from the plant without the need for heating. The immersed materials are left to macerate for a period, allowing the aromatic molecules to infuse into the solvent thoroughly. After maceration, the solvent is removed and filtered, resulting in a waxy substance that contains the trapped aromatic molecules. The third method of extraction is expression, which is likely the oldest method and simplest. Expression involves 
physically pressing or squeezing plant materials, such as citrus peels, to release their essential oils. This direct mechanical process extracts the essential oils from the plant materials, capturing the aromatic compounds without the need for additional solvents or heat. The fourth method, known as enfleurage, is employed, where the material is placed in a fatty substance, such as animal fat or vegetable oil. The material remains in contact with the fat for several days, allowing the essential oils to transfer into the fat. This process typically requires multiple repetitions. For instance, when extracting essential oils from flower petals, the petals are replaced with fresh ones after three or four days until the fat has absorbed a sufficient amount of the aromatic compounds. Enfleurage is a traditional method that facilitates the extraction of delicate fragrances from flowers or other fragile plant parts by allowing the essential oils to infuse into the fat or oil medium. The enfleurage process captures and preserves the desired aromatic molecules. This technique provides an alternate approach to obtaining essential oils and is particularly suited for materials that may not be suitable for other extraction methods. But this method is lengthy and labor-intensive. These various extraction methods provide flexibility in capturing the aromatic essence of different plants and blends. Each technique is employed based on the specific characteristics of the materials being utilized and the desired result. The four perfume-making methods we just discussed were developed and perfected over thousands of years and remain the primary means of producing concentrated fragrances until the 19th century. However, the discovery of synthesizing aromatic compounds by the chemical industry revolutionized perfume production, making these compounds abundant and relatively inexpensive. So, returning to ancient Mesopotamia, it is unclear whether Taputi invented solvent extraction or inherited the technique from previous generations. Nevertheless, she was at the forefront of perfume-making techniques during her time. It's important to note that the perfumes made in antiquity were not necessarily created in the same way as the modern perfumes found in bottles diluted with alcohol, and there is no indication that this technique ever existed in antiquity. Instead, fragrances were added to creams, waxes, candles, and cosmetic pastes, serving as vehicles for transportation and sale. Evidence suggests that what appears to be terracotta equipment that was found in the Indus Valley, east of India, dated 3000 BC, 5000 years ago was used for distillation. This system consisted of a terracotta container for boiling plant material with a cover featuring orifices and woven materials. Supposedly fabric would have been placed on top. The vapors would impregnate the fabric, which could then be wrung out to separate the oil. So, as you see, the ancient world was already knowledgeable about and engaged in the production of perfumes. 
potentially on a large scale. The oldest perfumery discovered, located on the island of Cyprus, operated approximately 4,000 years ago and encompassed a vast area of around 4,000 square meters. This suggests that perfume production occurred on a substantial, possibly industrial scale, likely exceeding the demands of Cyprus alone. So the perfumes would have been exported to the Middle East, Mesopotamia, Egypt, to archaic Greece. That was long before the rise of the Greek cities of the classical period, and possibly further west to North Africa, Italy, Iberia. Early on, there was a wide variety of ingredients for use. Flowers, herbs, fruits, or scented woods. They can be found almost everywhere. But as early as the Egyptians, a taste for exotic, different scents appeared. Things that were not familiar. This was one of the pillars of long-distance trade in the ancient world. Frankincense, myrrh, cinnamon were brought from Africa or Asia, and the Greeks, and later the Romans, had the same appetite for exotic rare fragrances. But near the end of the antiquity, Liquid perfumes were still mixes of oils used as a solvent with crushed herbs or petals. The oil was filtered and smelled good. There were many different scents. Perfumes in ancient times did not retain the exact scent of their original ingredients and tended to lose their fragrance rather quickly but a significant advancement in perfume production occurred during the Middle Ages in the Islamic world, spanning from Spain to Persia. Muslim perfume makers inherited the knowledge of their predecessors, but also garnered the interest and support of scholars who aimed to enhance perfume production. This was facilitated by the abundant ability of raw materials in the Muslim world. Being at the center of trade routes, perfumers in this era were enthusiastic in their experimentation and discovery, importing new plants from Asia, including bitter orange and various citrus trees, to the Middle East and Persia. Additionally, the Islamic world embraced the use of animal-based fragrance materials such as ambergris or musk. Ambergris specifically has always been challenging to find as it forms in the intestines of sperm whales. It is believed to develop around hard, sharp objects consumed by the whale and then expelled, and floats in the sea or washes up on beaches. That sounds a bit disgusting, so why use it in the perfumery? Ambergris was utilized in perfumery due to its chemical properties as a fixative, allowing fragrances to last longer. In modern times, Synthetic fixatives have replaced natural ambergris. Nevertheless, for a significant period, ambergris was highly valued and prized. It was also attributed various properties, often without a factual basis, such as protecting against the plague. This belief arose from the notion that the fragrance of ambergris would mask the unpleasant smell of the air 
which was believed to be the cause of the plague. Additionally, ambergris was utilized to flavor coffee or hot chocolate in the 18th century. In addition to ambergris, the ancient Egyptians also used certain materials, such as musk, in their perfumery, often burning them as incense. Musk, derived from the secretions of glands in animals like the musk deer, possessed of fixative properties and continues to be employed in perfumery. However, modern perfumes now utilize synthetic substitutes, known as base notes. That is to say that last longer when other scents have vanished. Muslim scholars in the perfumery field not only focused on ingredients, but also developed and refined techniques and recipes. One of the most significant advancements was the utilization of steam distillation in an alembic to extract oils from flowers. Previous extraction methods had the drawback of partially compromising or damage the scent of the materials due to the heat and the interaction between the scent and the receiving medium. Nonetheless, the distillation of flowers allowed for the extraction of highly intense and faithful scents closely resembling the original fragrance. Avicenna, a Persian doctor renowned for his contributions to various fields such as astronomy and philosophy, was among the pioneers who experimented with distillation, specifically focusing on roses. He succeeded in obtaining rose water that exhibited a more delicate and authentic aroma compared to any other flower perfume of that time. This development marked an important milestone in the history of perfume production and contributed to the advancement of extracting and preserving the scents of flowers. The influence of Islamic perfumery techniques and ingredients spread to Europe, primarily through Italy, and the trade routes established during that time. European perfumery was greatly shaped by this Islamic heritage, and many of the base ingredients used today, whether natural or synthetic replicas, have been in use for several centuries. While new ingredients have emerged, of course, the foundational elements have remained largely consistent, being combined and recombined in different ways. To achieve the transition to modern perfumery, one crucial step was taken. Mixing blended essential oils with an alcoholic solution this technique was first recorded in the 14th century in Hungary, resulting in a perfume that gained fame throughout Europe as Hungary water. But during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the center of European perfumery shifted to Italy. Italy's advantageous positioning provided the best access to exotic ingredients through cities like Venice and Genoa. Being relatively affluent, there was a demand for perfumes from aristocrats and merchants, as perfumes were considered highly expensive. So perfume makers relied on the patronage of wealthy individuals to thrive. In the 16th century, 
the center of European perfumery, as well as cosmetic production, moved to France, where the tradition continues to the present day. France became a hub for perfumery, attracting skilled craftsmen and maintaining a rich heritage in the industry. The shift to France further solidified its position as a leading force in the world of perfumery, building upon the foundations laid by Islamic influence and the advancements made in Italy. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the flourishing aristocracy and opulent royal courts played a significant role in supporting the perfume industry. This trend was particularly evident in France, where the Versailles world and Paris set the fashion standards that other European aristocracies sought to emulate. The demand for luxury products, including perfumes, soared among the wealthy clientele of the time. Unlike today's usage, where a few drops of perfume are applied, these affluent individuals would perfume everything, from clothing to furniture and fans. Consequently, they often placed orders for multiple bottles of perfume each month, resulting in exorbitant perfume budgets. This period, spanning the 16th to the 18th centuries, marked the birth of the French and Italian luxury industries. These regions became renowned purveyors of high-end products, not limited to perfumes and cosmetics alone. They also excelled in creating decorative ornaments, clothing, furniture, luggage, and various accessories. With the support of the royal courts and the aristocratic class, these industries developed a distinct image and acquired valuable expertise which they carried into the industrial era of the 19th and 20th centuries. This evolution is paralleled in the cosmetic industry as well. The perfume industry underwent a significant transition from catering to a niche clientele to reaching the mass market. While luxury fragrances may still be relatively expensive for consumers, there are perfumes available at various price points, including affordable options. The production cost of perfumes is comparatively low, with only a fraction of the price paid by consumers actually covering the product itself. The remaining costs are attributed to marketing efforts retail expenses, and profit margins. This drop in production costs was made possible by the substitution of numerous natural ingredients with synthetic counterparts, a development that began in the 19th century. In some cases, the synthetic molecules perfectly mimic their natural counterparts making it challenging even for the experts to distinguish between them. As a result, perfumes have permeated various aspects of our lives beyond what one might initially consider. They are present in an extensive range of everyday products, including not just shampoos, soaps, and scented candles, but also laundry detergents, household cleaning products, toothpaste, cosmetics, and even the larger market of artificial aromas and perfumes used in industrial food. While there is much more to delve into regarding cosmetics and perfume, this was just an introduction, and as always, 
I hope it makes you curious to discover more. We've come to the end of our little journey tonight. Now you can let go and sleep. And until we meet again, good night. Sleep well.